The Sounds of the Suburbs by the members on Revenge of the 80s Radio. The band's gone through some lineup changes, as many groups do, and longtime's members member, J.C. Carroll, and members of the members reunited back in 2007. They're active today. J.C.'s active solo today. He's with me now. Welcome to Revenge of the 80s Radio, J.C. Carroll. It's fantastic to be here. I want to start from the beginning, and I have a lot of good stuff. You have a new album out. The members had one out a couple years ago. We're going to talk about all of that, but I, I want to start where you started before you joined the members you worked with graham parker before he became a big star how did the two of you hook up and wind up recording together well graham graham lived in a village very close to the village i grew up in and i met him in a pub in a, in a tiny village called bagshot and we we met over a jukebox and we shared a love of similar music and one day he uh, i said to him look my father's just got a new tape recorded do you fancy coming to my house and doing making some recordings so he came to my house and um i put one microphone in the cupboard and put a guitar amp in there and i stuck one microphone up in the room and i recorded him and myself on an akai stereo reel to reel at seven and a half inches per second and um that was a great little tape and he took it to london and it helped him start his career he's a fantastic musician i'm in touch with him today he lives upstate new york now he's he's a great guy but he kind of kicked off my career and he also helped us get our first record deal with stiff records that's right you guys did this on a uh, real reel to reel the old grease pen and the razor blade editing that's exactly right yeah and we only stopped doing that razor blade editing in 1983 the last uh, album that we did in 1983 was all cut together on tape and um yeah, it's it, it's a it's an interesting thing. I mean, the world the world's changed, and recordings changed so much since then. It's really interesting. That's right. The, 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 those young whippersnappers know nothing from this from from real editing. That's it. Well, we didn't have very much time in the studio to make records, and so you had to get it right, and you had to get it really quickly. And there was no Pro Tools or Apple Logic to help you edit the bad bits out. It was That's all true. there, and uh, the tape doesn't lie. JC, you were working in the banking industry for a bit. How did you become a member of the members? Well, what happened is that I was supposed to go to um, university and I looked at the form and it was too complicated and I've never been with, good with forms. So I looked at the newspaper and, it, and the, in the newspaper there was an advert saying foreign exchange. And I honestly believed that would be getting a job overseas. And I answered the advert and uh, before long I was uh, working in a merchant bank working in stocks and shares in uh, in London in 1975. I suddenly became um, a bank clerk. And uh, then one day on the train, I met a guy who was coming down from Liverpool University. And he said, oh, I'm forming a band. Do you want to join the band? And um, it turned out that it was a guy called Nick Tesco that started the members. And so there I was. Suddenly, I was in a in a punk rock band it was great it was fantastic oh, from the corporate world to the punk world that's always good actually from the punk world to the corporate world to the punk world <laughs> that's an interesting trip it was really really different and i was working in the daytime i was like clark kent you know i was working the mild-mannered bank clerk in the daytime and then in the evening i was playing all these crazy clubs and london in 1977 was very exciting it was probably as exciting as london was in the six swinging 60s there was clubs everywhere. It was a huge social scene around the scene. And it was just, it was a real place to be. It was a fantastic place. And that's around the time the members really started taking off as far as success. Interestingly, and I want to add this in because your drummer at the time, Adrian Lillywhite, uh, would wind up playing the skins for a lot of uh, projects, including King for their 1986 Bittersweet album. I bring that up because that quartet didn't have a drummer beforehand. Yeah, that's right. Adrian Lillywhite was, um, went on to play with King and he was... Um, his brother was a very, very famous um, yes. record producer called Steve Lillywhite. And um, Steve cut his teeth on early members' records and went on to become very, very um, in demand with the U2 in the 80s and people like that. Absolutely. That was the other thing. J.C. Carroll's with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. The band is described as a mix of punk reggae surf on your website, on the members' website, J.C., not the J.C. Okay. Carroll website. I like the combo, and the late 70s, early 80s was a time where different and inventive genres were encouraged. Not like today. Well, that could be another conversation as a whole. I mean, it's hard to put anything in any kind of box. So how did the members' sound come together through the late 70s? 
Well, we were very interested in that. We were in, Nick Tesco and myself were really interested in reggae, and um, and I had this surf thing, you know, and we we'd, we'd all play. A lot of early bands of that period all had very cheap guitars, and um, we didn't have the, the the Gibsons with the humbuckers pickups in. We had these cheap single coil guitars, and a single coil makes a really um, surf sound, like the Ventures and the Safaris. And you'll notice that kind of a lot of bands around in America were doing the same sort of thing. They had a kind of surf element, like the B-52s. You know, the, even the Dead Kennedys and the, um, and the Ramones had these Moserite surf guitars. So surf was quite near the surface of all the punk rock. So we had this mixture of basically was what we call punk and then surf and, um, and uh, reggae. And we always started our set with a sort of twangy instrumental song. So it was quite an interesting sound. And it's, we still play those songs today. So people are obviously not fed up with them. When we think early punk and alternative from Britain, many tend to conjure up their uh, ideas of the rougher areas of London, Glasgow, or other major cities. The members and some other bands from that era came via the suburban towns, which became a scene of its own. Considering the bias toward the big city underground artists, how tough was it to be taken as, and for a lack of a better term, seriously, but I think you know where I'm going here, by the rest of the music community? And fans. Well, it was very interesting. There was a clique in London that controlled punk rock, and it was about 200 people that were all art school people. It was made out that it was from the rough parts of town, but it actually was an art school clique. <laughs> and um, one time, I, we, we came from this leafy suburb called um, Camby in Surrey, and the, up the road with the jam, and there were lots of bands and from these areas. And one day I was playing a tune, and we were playing to a group of, uh, in a place in London, West London. We noticed all these young kids had crept up, and they'd all got the bus from the suburbs, and they didn't have the right clothes, and they were all underage. And they, yeah, but they, I just thought, you know what? These, this is the next generation. These are the people that are really hungry for the music. And luckily, I wrote a song for them, and it was the sound of the suburbs, and, and it became an anthem for them. And it suddenly. What we did, it was quite incredible, but suddenly it, it became the property of all the kids from the little satellite towns instead of just the trendy inner city thing. So it, it, it was a real, it was a big record. It's exactly 40 years today the record came out. And we sold um, a quarter of a million copies in the UK in about three weeks. So it was a real phenomenon. We go on to, you go on the program called Top of the Pops, which is... Um, a nationwide TV program, and it it would break a band. You would be you would become famous from it, and so the suburbs is very much in our in our um, in our makeup, and and it's it's all about the kids sitting in their bedrooms out in these in these satellite towns, and it's it's the same in the USA, and and it's the same everywhere. It's a big scene out in the suburbs. You're right about that. And a lot of the uh, the buyers, and people kind of forget this, the, the population areas are the cities. Yes, we know that. But a lot of people with some bucks will buy uh, you know, the summer jobs, that sort of thing. The kids will, will buy records. They'll buy tapes. They'll buy the 12-inch uh, remixes, if you will. And they're from the suburbs, too. And they're pretty populated as well, considering that they're more spread out. The members later on started gaining international success the u.s and australia in particular attract like working girl and maybe a little bit less reggae than uh, the the uh, offshore banking businesses of the world talk about your transition to the international scene well what happened is we had we had two very ambitious managers and um they we had a hit in england they should write you going to america and so within three months of having this hit in england we did a big english tour and we were booked on on a plane to go to new york and so in 1979, we found ourselves in New York and um, where we did a few gigs and then we went over to L.A. And then we flew across the Pacific to New Zealand and Australia. So we went around the world in 80 days from from the beginning of the year. I, I gave my, my day job in the bank in December. And by the next December, I'd been around the world, had hits. The scene in New York and um, in and. Uh, San Francisco and LA was was just starting off, and I met lots of fantastic people, including uh, members of the Go Go's, and Ramones, and Blondie, and it was just a real. Um, we, we, our management were keen for us to go around the world and sow the seeds of what we were doing. It was a slight mistake because people in England forgot us when we went away, but 
it was um, it proved to be good because we went back later and uh, we had many friends in the U.S. and we still have. J.C. Carroll is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. We're going to talk more members and his solo career along with a new album. All that straight ahead on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Working Girl from the members on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Longtime members member J.C. Carroll. I like saying that, by the way. <laughs> members member, a member of the members. J.C. Carroll's yeah. with me now. Yeah, I tell a lot of bad jokes and bad puns, so this, this is just ripe for the whole thing. I have to ask these questions because I saw this on the website, among other things. You guys were threatened by mobsters? What happened there? In the East Coast of this America, in the, in the 1970s, late 70s, 1980s, a lot of um, nightclubs were run by uh, Italian-Americans that had other businesses. And um, they ran the clubs as covers for their other businesses. And so um, some of these gentlemen were really nice and some of them were so nice. <laughs> and it was like it was like that scene in Goodfellas. They would have a club and they would burn it down for the insurance money and they would use the uh they would you could go and to pay the money in on a Monday from other things and I played to empty plug uh, clubs up in uh, where people there's nobody there but they pay you anyway because it's a front for their other business. So I mean, America was, and New York was a very, very interesting place in 1979. It was a completely different place than what it is now. There was after hours clubs. There was a lot of craziness there. And um, so we did have, we were threatened by gangsters. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was an interesting time. Some of them were, were, some of the gangsters were actually really nice and some of them weren't so nice. So they, there we go. So part of our rich. <laughs> they threatened to make you guys the dismembers. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. Kind of, yeah. Dismember us, yeah. No, but there was also, yeah. No, they were they were heavy duty, and I mean, we've been threatened by police. We've had guns pulled on us, all sorts of things. It's um. How'd you get in trouble with Dutch immigration? Well, what we used to do, I mean, this is terrible. We were young guys, and what we used to do is we used to um, when you got on a boat, they would have duty free liquor, and we were like kind of school kids on a school trip. So as soon as we got on the boat we would buy a bottle of liquor and drink it kind of almost immediately because we were kind of young guys and kind of out of control. And so it, it all got a bit out of hand and they locked us in a, in a, in a cell and they weren't good. They were going to send us back, but they let us do the show. You know, so <laughs> and we, we, we were very wild. I mean, we just, we just left our jobs and we were young men and we thought that that was what you would do. You know, we, we, we were wild. You among other artists, JC, have said in interviews and I've read this as well, it's important to develop another skill or have some good work outside of the music or other artistic industry. Yours seems to be in the business world. After the members broke up a few years later, you and your wife, designer Sophie Lynn, opened a boutique that became a go-to place for music makers and future stars. How did you make the dispensary a rather excellent venture? Well, what happened is that we, we um, I met my wife and uh, I was helping a guy that ran a store and she said, I'm thinking of opening a shop. And, and I said, well, I can help you there. And we, we, we opened a shop and we put some, some vintage clothing and we put some new clothing in there. And then the vintage clothing sold. And we suddenly we thought, well, you know what? People want these styles. So we went to the factories in the east, east end of London and started making our own clothes. And we had loads of, lots of weird things happened. I mean, for example, we found this guy making platform shoes in the, in the West End, in, in the East End, of still making platform shoes. So we put some in the shop, and lo and behold, the woman from Delight bought some, you know, and Madonna bought a pair. And they became huge parts of pop videos. We saw when Kylie Minogue was making her first album, she came into our store, and she had bought a, some, a hat and a bra from us, and they featured on her first album. So suddenly we became the go-to place for all 80s pop stars and people were always making videos so people were always coming into the show into the store to um to get close for the videos because we had the best eye and so we we, we gave we kitted um lisa stansfield out with her trademark black cap bono brought the, her cedic jewish hat from me and that featured very heavily on a lot of his publicity shots in the early days 
and we were the um, boutique to the stars in the eight, in the uh, late eighties, early nineties. Um, it was a very very interesting time, and it, it our creativity, my creativity took a completely different uh, turn, and so I went from being musician, and I was we started a young family, and young families need money, and so we, we, the shop was the sensible thing to do you know we we had to work hard and to bring that up the young children so myself and my wife worked very hard and we had, ended up with four shops at one stage in the in the portobello road and um carnaby street areas of london and it was very it was an interesting time and you know we worked very hard for maybe 20 years making clothes and um i still kept in with the with the um music as a sideline at the time, but it, it, it took over my life for a while, but it also helped bring up the children because of being a musician, the income is not as regular as having a shop. As a radio guy, I can definitely agree with you, JC. You have to be prepared yeah, for is. things that happen. And you also don't want to be forced to jump into something that might, let's say, compromise the work you've done throughout your career, compromise your hard work or, or your, in your case, your art, in my case, uh, what I like to do. Well, you're right there. And actually, what you can do is you can start making. Yeah, you don't want to compromise that. You you have to do. And if it's bet, sometimes it's better not to do anything, or to go into your um, or to do something else. Uh, I mean, I got involved at the same time in doing some music for um, movies, and um, it that was an interesting journey as well. I I I learned how to score movies, and I got to make some very interesting friends and music for films, something which I still do now. But uh, you, compromising your art is a really important thing because nowadays it's much more difficult to earn money from music, but we all still produce it. We, 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 we get, I'm sure that you, you you make radio shows. That's that's what you do. I make music. It's um, You have to uh, develop different income streams to support that creativity especially in today's economy but then again that's another conversation for another day yeah, yeah that's right yeah you were in a brando movie weren't you that's right i worked on a movie called um don juan de marco which was quite an interesting movie because it has a fantastic soundtrack by a great composer called michael Kamen, who worked with you know he did um robin hood prince of thieves and lots of other fantastic films but uh he, I met him and I was playing accordion for, with a folk group at the time. And he said, oh, I need accordion in this movie. So we went in there and we, we recorded some some cues for the movie. And it was kind of an end of an era because it was the beginning of Johnny Depp's career and the end of Marlon Brando's film, uh, career. Also, I'd say Dunaway in it. I think it was a fantastic film. Well worth a, 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 with a brilliant score. And that was my first little foray into film music and I've done quite a few movies since then but that was my very first start and it, it's a beautiful movie if you get a chance to see it. And tell our listeners a bit about The Wise Monkeys, JC. Well, The Wise Monkeys was a folk group that I, when I had my shop I still wanted to play music so I had the local folk group and I was a little bit disillusioned with them with them, with pop music so I went I went folk and I, I picked up the accordion and the mandolin and and I decided to go off and search in my French Irish roots. And um, so it was a local folk group, and I joined up with them. And we, we we played in pubs in the evenings, and we played weddings and all sorts of things. And one day, our bass player was painting somebody's house. It's quite famous singer's house. And um, he said, "Oh, she wants to come and sing with us tonight." So we found ourselves upstairs in the pub with um, Sinead O'Connor singing with us. There's a great video of it on, on YouTube. So we did a show with Sinead O'Connor, and she was fantastic. She sang backing vocals for me, and um, and uh, we um, backed her up on a song. And uh, so that the, the Wise Monkeys lasted about fifteen years of um, of playing throughout. Um, we even made it over to New York, and it was my folk group. And I was very. I didn't, we didn't really record very much, but it was a it was a little kind of journey that I needed to take before I went back to playing with the members and uh, and rock and roll. From 1977 to the band's breakup and into today, you were the constant in the members. What made you decide to reform them? Well, basically, I had my 50th birthday, and I just thought, you know what I'd like to do? I, every decade of my life, I, I thought things happened. For example, when I was 30, I was so depressed, I thought I'd never be a pop star again. 
And then by the time I was 32, I'd opened a shop and started a family. And then by the time I was 40, you know, I thought, well, nothing's happening. And then I started making films. And then when I got to 50, I thought, you know what? I want to get all the people I've ever played with together in the room and play some music for my party. So I hired a room and I phoned up all the members. I said, do you fancy coming to play? And they all turned out and the wise monkeys turned up as well. And we had a great party and we got to play seven or eight numbers with the members and it sounded great, you know. So I thought, well, I want to put the band on the road again, back together again. I was, uh, and so that's how the band initially reformed. We didn't do, we did a few shows and then, yeah, that's how we started. So, I mean, it's been going sort of for 12 years now, the, se- the second breath of members, because the original lineup was only busy from 77 to 83. So that's, uh, six years but this time around we've been doing it for 12 years the members latest album and you've done a bunch of things over the years you've played a lot you're going to be doing some touring but their latest album is 2016's one law yeah tell us about the current lineup and i believe you're going to be out doing some uh, gigs this year as well well we've um, the current lineup is myself uh, uh the guitar on guitar and vocals the original bass player a guy called chris payne on uh, guitar and vocals a guy called Nick Cash who's been playing with us on and off for 10 years. He's a re- he's from um, an 80s band called Fad Gadget. Um, he's, uh, and he's, he's a great friend of ours. He's been, been with us for 10 years. And we have a, a new boy in the group. We have a, a Swedish guitarist called Paul Engelmark. And he's been playing with us for four years. And uh, we, we're, we go out as a four-piece. We tour all over Europe. Um, we've been to the US, we've been to Australia and New Zealand, and uh, I'm looking at uh, various shows this year. I've had some inquiries from the US and Canada. I'm not sure yet when and when we are going, but uh, yeah, no, the band of, we, we keep busy. We keep very busy, and we, I love doing live shows. And the thing about doing live shows is I love meeting the audience. And uh, the other thing is when you're a band of our age, you have a special skill. You can make people in their 50s, 40s, and 60s feel like they're 17 again. So by playing those songs, you can give people their youth back. And so it's our job to give people's youth back to them. Well, we appreciate that. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I could use a little <laughs> bit of that as well. You can find out more about the tours at the members.co.uk. That's the members.co.uk. Find out where they're playing. While the members were back together, you still did quite a bit on your own, JC, including a new album, West Byfleet Selfie. And the album cover is basically a selfie of you in West Byfleet. That's right, yeah. It seems to be a little bit of a lot of things, maybe a a span of what you do from then and now. I did notice a mix of old members' reggae sound in some of the tracks, like 1972 and The Rain in California. Well, yeah, what I've done is I've taken my film music palette and mixed it with what I do best with the members. So we have a nice, there's two really beautiful reggae tracks that you mentioned. In 1972 is a, is a reworking of a theme from Love Story, which is a very fantastic piece of, written by film music composer, Francis Lai, who's just died. And um, so, yeah, then I take my little tools out. I've got a toolbox for the members and I've got a toolbox for the film music. And um, funnily enough, a lot my film music toolbox is a lot of mandolin, accordion, and synthesizer. So in some of the tracks, you will hear those those sounds, and it's like painting. The, t- the first track in the, on the album is called Painting in the Sky with Sound, and it's what you do. Painting in the Sky is what we do. The music is no longer about pieces of plastic. It's about broadcasting digital files around the world on YouTube, on Facebook, and on the radio waves. And that's what we do. And it's really interesting because you making your, your radio station and me making a song is the same thing, but painting pictures and telling stories with sound. So that's what my album is, Painting in the Sky with Sound. Also, noting you did say you played a lot of synth in this, uh, there are some traditional, non-traditional rock instrumentations as well. Let's go to Looking for Love. It features your accordion acumen in 3-4 time, by the way, I might add. Oh, that's, um, that song is um, is dedicated um, well, it's to a, a, a very famous musician called Clifton Chenier, who was a, a 
Cajun accordion, a Zydeco Cajun accordion. So that is a waltz, and it's got a, a Zydeco Cajun uh, break in it, and it's it's a it kind of sticks out. It's very different from the rest of the songs on the album, and it wasn't going to be on there, but it's just a real fun song, and it's about a guy phoning up all his ex-girlfriends trying to get together with at least one of them, I think. This goes to your earlier solo career when you learned a lot of different instruments and the accordion included, of course. Um, how did you get interested in the, let's say, the unrock rock instruments at the time, I'll say? I don't know. I've always wanted to expand, you know. Um, I, I was sitting in my studio one day and I thought, I wonder if what, I, oh, this really needs an accordion on it. And I went to the pub at 10 o'clock in the night, which is something I do. I always go at 10. And somebody said to me, JC, do you know anybody that wants to buy an accordion? So I bought it. And, um, and it, things, when I went to Germany a few years back, I went to a flea market and there was this wonderful instrument called a zither that's sitting there all unloved. And I thought, well, that's for me, you know. And so I brought the zither home. And if you listen to film music, and specifically a really fantastic composer called, um, oh, um, who's the guy that did the Sergio Leone films? Um, oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. You know um, anyway, he, they use lots of interesting things. The guy that does the James Bond films, um, uh, you know, my, they both slip my mind, and they're my mo most famous composers. They all use instru interesting instruments to evoke different feelings. And so I got into that. And it's about your palette and painting with different sounds and adding some textures to your pictures that you don't normally hear. That's how why I use different instruments. I'm not fantastic at any of them. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, you know, if you listen to the good, the bad and the ugly or the the theme from Once Upon a Time in the West, you hear all sorts of music boxes and flutes and strange instruments. And I, I just love painting my pictures with different sounds. The track you're going to play later on, Trans-European, Trans-Siberian Express, starts off with traditional instruments and ends up very much with synthesizers. So it's quite nice to mix them all together and to make a nice collage. Have you ever ridden on the Trans-Siberian Railway? I want to. And that has to I be really done. I'd like to. to do that too. That's on the bucket list for me. The reason I wrote the song is that my great aunt was in Russia during when the revolution happened, and she escaped with her white Russian cavalry officer boyfriend down the Trans Siberian Express to Vlad Vladivostok. And so it's a story about her fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution. And it's just a really nice picture. And a lot of white Russians did that. They went all the way to the Pacific because they couldn't escape to the West and, you know, France or anything because they were blocked off. So they, they went down the country. I, I just wanted to, it just sounds fantastic. It sounds very, very romantic and interesting. It's definitely on my bucket list. It's always good to tell a story with your music too. And that's a rather interesting one. Yes. And because the world is full of baby I love you songs and I love yeah. you because and um, songs about people um, not being loved and big thing about I mean, when we, in 1977 we said well, we can't write love songs you have to write to tell a story and some of the best songs do tell fantastic stories you know it seems that the story song has disappeared with popular music today and maybe it should come back but uh... I don't know. Maybe you need a more of an attention span for it too. Who knows? There's lots of really interesting subjects. I mean, that have disappeared from popular music. Uh, we had uh, current music is very, very. Um, it's much more tame than it ever was. I mean, in the 40s and 50s, there was a lot of bad man songs. John Cash, Johnny Cash wrote bad man songs, and he wrote some great songs. You do find interesting stories more in. in you find quite a few interesting stories in country country music, but actually more than pop music. But there were fantastic songs around in the 40s and 50s and 60s, but they, we, we live in a sort of slightly, everything's been uh, sanitized now, and so we don't have story songs, and we don't have um, bad man songs, and we don't have prison songs. We don't have songs about people going to prison, you know. Or, That's right. We need I do, more prison I do songs. A version of, well, you know, 
Folsom Prism or, uh, you know, Elvis Presley singing, you know, uh, Jailhouse Rock and well, stuff about, like that. Well, think about Cash and Johnny Cash, and that's an interesting thing you bring up, the prison songs, because he had a lot of sympathy for uh, for people who were in prison. And uh, I'm not a Johnny Cash uh, historian, but I did have one on another show that I produced, and he discussed how uh, how that happened. And it was a long process. It was, it was a long journey for him, but uh, he made a point to try to tell stories from their points of view. Yeah, and also, those stories are much more interesting. They're much more interesting because they're stories of real life. And um, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tradition in America, and they call it the... Uh, they're called... There's a whole tradition of bad man songs and uh, stagger lead songs, they're called. And it's all about a bad man. And uh, they they... There's a huge long tradition of them. I don't know. I, I, I revived one on a solo album called "The Rock Is in the Laptop." I did a song called "The Streets of Light Chapel," which was a reworking of "The Streets of Laredo," which is another bad man song. It's a song about a dying cowboy, and um, they're just great pieces of narrative. They're stories, and uh, the people, it's, they're interesting. And even "Delilah" by Tom Jones is a bad man song. I mean, the guy stabs his wife to death. That's right. That's right. That's right. You wouldn't get that on the radio today. I was I no. have a great friend here who's who's a who's a radio plugger. And I was saying to him, say for example, the Rolling Stones Brown Sugar has got a lot of really bad stuff going on it. And it's got slavery, misogyny, all sorts of things. You wouldn't get that. You wouldn't if you went into the radio the BBC and said I had a song about a guy that's stabbing his wife to death. You wouldn't get that on the radio. <laughs> Tom Jones had a huge hit with it. And, and don't forget the uh, Jim Croce hits, uh, "Bad Bad Leroy Brown" and uh, and "Don't Mess Around with Jim." Those were about some bad guys. Of course, they got their comeuppance at the end. They are Stagger Lee songs. They yeah. are they're, they're Stagger Lee songs. Ah. They are, and they're that's they're part of the tradition. It's, if you look it up, it's called Stagger Lee. There's Stagger Lee shot Billy with his own forty five. Gotcha. And people like singing about bad guys. You know, you know I, I don't know. That's just kind of a... There's still <laughs> bad guys in, in music, I guess. And people like Alice Cooper is a, is, is a brilliant bad guy. You know, people love the baddie, don't they? I, I guess they do. And, and they provide interesting stories, like you said, too. And maybe they're for the internet uh, YouTube watchers now. And, and there are plenty of YouTube videos, videos about serial killers and bad men that get a lot of views. And, and I understand where you're coming from because some of them provide interesting stories. You don't get to hear them when you're going to school. You don't get to uh, read about them until you get your hands on them. It's almost like forbidden fruit sometimes. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the forbidden fruit that's sweetest, you know. And also, there's just far too many love songs on the way to you know, it's just, it's just up with them. I've had enough of love songs. I mean, I've got a couple of love songs. I do write them. But um, I have, yeah, I have got a couple of love songs on my, my album. I've got a death song and a love song. How about some bad man I wrote songs? a song for my death. I wrote a song for my my funeral. That's on the Out West Bike Loop South Yard. And I've got one. I don't want. I want. want I've got a special song. I've got a rate all arranged. JC, I also understand uh, the members have something new coming out in the U.S. very soon. Well, that's right. We work very closely with a record label in Los Angeles called Cleopatra Records, and they've commissioned an album of cover versions, and we've done some fantastic cover versions for them, and made an album called Version, which will be released in the U.S. on CD and vinyl in the spring. So it's the new album by the members called Version. And they've also released the members' greatest hits just at the tail end of last year. So you can buy all our hits on vinyl, blue vinyl, and CD. So there's two albums, the greatest hits and Version coming out in the U.S. So you could spend your hard-earned dollars on those J.C. Carroll, I want to thank you once again for joining us on Revenge of the 80s Radio. You can find out more about what J.C. is doing on his website, jccarroll.com. That's jccarroll.com. It was fantastic speaking to you, Chris. We enjoyed having you on as well, J.C. Let's play a track from your new album, West by Fleet Selfie, released in 2018, Trans-Siberian Railway, on Revenge of the 80s Radio.